Our Visiting Geographical Scientists series continues here with Dr. Maria Fadiman, Associate Professor of Geography at Florida Atlantic University, where she will be speaking on people and plants. I'd like to have a round of applause, please, for Dr. Fadiman. Okay. Thank you so very much. And by the way, our uh, geograph International Geographical Honor Society chapter is selling t-shirts to support the education of girls in sub-Saharan Africa. And they will be in the back of the room afterward. Okay. Thank you so very much. Maria, take it away. Do I go down here? Where, where do you want to go? I'll be down here. This works. You go here. You <laughs> this, or do you have one? I think, right? Is just where y'all can hear me? <laughs> All right, well, we're just hoping I don't sing. That, that was good, but I'm not going that here. All right, well, I am um, I'm super excited to be here. I, I appreciate you guys inviting me, and I heard the weather was different last week, and given my choice of shoes, <laughs> I'm pleased that it's nice as it is. Everyone that you can see, I'm fine down here, up there is, we're all good? Everyone's like, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so, People and plants, um, conservation of forests and culture. So I, I do this. We're going to use some examples from Tibet and Africa. And uh, within geography, I do ethnobotany. And again, when you say you're a geographer, people often go, oh, you study, you're a, a what? <laughs> and with ethnobotany, they just don't do anything. They just go, what, did you speak? <laughs> yes. So ethnobotany is really the relationship between people and, and plants. Actually, you know what? I'm coming up here because now I feel really important. <laughs> and I can see all you people back there, the back ones too. OK. Um, so you've got people and plants. And, and this can be, you can have medicinal plants, fiber plants, food, construction, spiritual. And then there are some uses that are somewhat uh, unexpected. I'm going to use an example from the Amazon before we get to Tibet and Africa. That I was working with a, with a group out there, the, the, actually the Ashwar, and they invited us to be part of one of their ceremonies. And so you got up early, early in the morning, and it's dark, and you're walking out. And when we emerged, there were elders sitting around this fire and this bubbling pot of leaves. And you sit down, and everyone takes a gourd, and they give you one, and you start to, to drink the, the brew. And you're like, <laughs> and of course, I was like, is this a hallucinogen? <laughs> like, no, you're good. I'm like, OK. And I don't really know what's supposed to happen, but I just keep. <laughs> and then I noticed that some of the people in the group started to peel off. And then I heard this, bleh, bleh. And I was like, <clears throat> I'm like, no, no, you have to drink. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll be culturally sensitive. And oh, and this is a plant. And I'm thinking, there is no way I'm doing this. I'm like, no, 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 drink another one. Like, oh. like, you have to drink faster. <laughs> All right. And they said, drink another, drink another. I was like, great, if I'm up at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'll only try and do this thing. So I'm And then the, the one where she said, OK, come on, it's our turn. And I'm like, huh. So we go out, and she. I hear this blip, blip, these little dainty splatters. And I'm thinking, oh, no. So I'm over here, but I don't throw up very easily. So I'm um, <sighs> she's like, I know you aren't throwing up. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, not much. <laughs> and she said, take one of the leaves of the plants and stick it down your throat. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding? Oh, fine. So I take it, and I blah, blah, and bleh. And I was like, yeah. I'm really, it was just kind of the water I had just drank. But I was like, you know, I can throw up with the indigenous people. I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> this is what it's all about. And so we go back there, and they're all sitting there, and everybody has thrown up. And now you analyze your dreams. And, and really, I could have done it without the whole ceremony. I'm like, this was terrible. <laughs> Um, but for them, you know, the leaves, these are essential. And this is important to their culture and who they are. And I had to get that if I was going to be connecting people and plants. What does it mean to people? 
And now, this is way out in the Amazon. This is some example out in the boonies. But when we look at, at us and here in our relationship with plants, like, OK, maybe medicinal construction, you know, spiritual, religious. But there's a certain time of year where we all put a certain plant outside of our house at the end of October. And it has to be a certain one. It has to be round and orange. OK, and then what do we do with it? What do you, yes, we have to carve it, right? We all know that. And if you were going to do the traditional carving, what shape would you make the eyes? Triangle, yeah, y'all are kind of, it's all right, you shout at me and then I feel good, okay, <laughs> yes. Uh, triangles, and we know that. And then you put it, what do you put in it before you put it out front? A candle. And then you've got this thing out there, this is a super ritualistic. Use. And if one year I said, you know what, I'm not doing that. I, I've been out in the Amazon. I'm going to carve a big old zucchini into a snake. Mm. You just don't, right? It, it has to be that plant, and it's used in this very ritualistic way. So when we say, oh, you know, you've got to go out in the boonies to get that kind of connection, you don't. We, we have that here, too, this connection with, with plants. So starting off with, with Africa. There's the saying, when an elder dies, a library burns. And this is an African proverb, but this could be in, in any part of the world. When, when someone older dies, all this information goes with them. And for me, a lot of what I concentrate on is, and all of that medicinal, or all that useful, all that plant information also goes with them. So we thought, well, let's not feel bad about it. Let's build a library. Woo! That's sort of a big job. So we thought, well, let's start with a booklet. And this is just Grace Gobbo. She is somebody else with whom I was working. She's also a National Geographic Emerging Explorer from, from Tanzania, just to give her some credit. So what, what were the goals of the project? One, does creating a booklet help maintain ethnobotanical knowledge? What role does language play in this endeavor? What are the most effective ways to include people in the process? So I'm out in this African village, and um, I'm trying to blend in, which I don't. <laughs> so I decided I was going to get a little bicycle. A lot of the researchers come in, and, and you rent um, four-wheel drives, which makes sense to get around. But I didn't have to go that far, so I, had a, so I got a little bicycle. And for some reason, it was very small, and I would get on it, and I would be biking. And the first day, I had to go through a village in order to get out there. And I'm on my bicycle. And the kids, um, the kids see me, and they start to shout, oh! <laughs> like, oh! And they're super excited because it's a foreigner. And I'm thinking, this is what I wanted. I am connecting with the people. And they want to see me. And they come running out, and I panicked completely. And I start to ride on my bicycle faster and faster. And these kids are chasing me, and I'm riding away on this little bicycle. And I think, oh my gosh, what, what kind of researcher am I? I was like, well, clearly that kind of researcher. So I sort of got, my, got myself together. I learned a little bit of Kiswahili, the, the language they speak, one of the languages they speak. And I worked out how to say, um, you can touch me. You can touch my bike. Uh, please don't unzip my backpack and take out my bananas. <laughs> and once we had that, that basic balance, then it all worked, worked really well. So there was some initial field work comfort that we all, we all had to get. So who are these people? They're the Ha. And I was working in Tanzania, and they like Tanganyika. Um, and I was in Bubango. And which is near Gombe Stream National Park. And, and that will become important a little bit later. So what's the, what's the area like Miombo Woodlands? You've got farming. Oil palms are a big industry there. And deforestation is a problem. So you have people collecting it for their firewood. They need to cook their food for construction to build their homes. And deforestation is important no matter where you are. But this is particularly important because this community is right next to that Gombe National Park. And Gombe National Park is particularly important. 
That's where Jane Goodall did her research. Just who's heard of Jane Goodall? You just, yeah. And, and those of you who haven't, you will, and it's, you know, she's, oh. So Jane Goodall worked with chimpanzees. And this is the area where she worked, and these are where her chimps are. So we went over there. Where I was working was just right over this hill. And then um, this is the, the park. And we were in the park to basically kind of look at some deforestation, look at what the park was like. And we're hiking and hiking. And the people we're with say, well, we're going to make sure you see chimps. And not that chimpanzees aren't really cool, but that, that's not exactly what I do. So I wasn't that. I was like, oh, OK. Um, and we're hiking and hiking. And it's up and it's down. And it's hot and it's tiring. And it's been about seven and a half hours. I'm like, we're going to see some chimps. And I'm like, I don't care if we see chimps. <laughs> Just, I'm, I want to go home. And then suddenly out of the forest, you see these big brown blobs coming out. And it was a big group. And there were 14 chimps. And it was suddenly, I mean, it was just unreal. And when a chimp comes and sits near you, you know, I mean, talking about it now, I mean, it, just, it gives you the chills. You're like, ah. Oh. I mean, I can't believe I didn't want to see a chimp. <laughs> what kind of idea was I? And sitting there, and then she turned, and she scratched her chin, and then she looked at me. And it was, you know, I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, I am the chimp whisperer. <laughs> and this is awesome. And we're looking, and then she gets up, and she starts to come towards me. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is it. You know, Jane Goodall, eat your heart out. <laughs> Here we go. And she comes right to me, and she picks up a rock, and she throws it at my head. <laughs> I'm like, ah! And the, the guys are like, oh, oh. I'm like, oh, oh. And they said, yeah, you don't want to look them in the eye. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to stick with the plants. OK. Um, yeah, it was just big and strong, you know, big rock. And we're like, oh, you know, you didn't die. Cool. And everyone's like, all right, cool, let's keep going. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> um, so that was pretty incredible. I would see the chimps just don't look them in the eye if you, if you get out there. Um, so the methodology for what we were doing for our project we were doing both informal and semi-structured interviews, all with informed consent. So everybody who was a part of it was, was agreeing. We had 21 people that we were selecting as the ethnobotanical experts uh, in these categories, medicine, crafts, music, construction, food, and rituals. And what we had is each one of them to discuss their top five plants. They all know many, many, many plants, but we had to limit it to make it doable. And then the entire group of them voted on which plants we included in the book. So I'm very, I'm very excited. I'm on the back of a motorcycle. We'll talk a little bit later what motorcycles are in my life. But um, going out to the study site, so I'm on this motorcycle, and there's wind, and they're speaking Kiswahili, which I can, you know, I can say banana over and over again. I'm like, Ndizi, Ndizi, and I don't know what else we're saying. But finally, he's basically saying, what are you doing in the back of my motorcycle? I'm like, oh. So I start to explain. We're working on making a booklet of the plants within this, this community. And it was important when we go out to the community, do they want this? And, and the answer was yes. Um, this one man said, the children are not learning about how to use plants. They only care about their cell phones. And um, when you're out there, there's no electricity in these villages. Uh, they've all got cell phones. And often, people don't eat more than one meal a day. That's very common out there. And they'll still have their cell phones. So we're interviewing the elders. They're the ones with the, the knowledge. And uh, just for an example, we've got musical instrument plants. Um, but they're not the only ones who are interested. So we're talking with the elders. But if you look up in the window, oh, they've got the little, little peekers are looking in. and. There was a lot of curiosity. What were we, who <laughs> were foreigners, what were we so interested in? And the fact that it was the knowledge of their elders about plants, that then became interesting simply through our presence and working on the, the project. And then, so then they started to watch all aspects of it. You have other villagers. You have the kids. So, Learning something else, a little bit about scientific method. But again, ah, plants, plants, the importance of them. 
<laughs> we'll just handle this right now. This is one of the motorcycle drivers. And what his shirt says is, please tell your boobs to stop staring at my eyes. <laughs> so now he doesn't speak English, so it's sort of irrelevant to him what's on his shirt. But that's what's happening. <laughs> so. Yep. Um, so we've got the boob man watching, I mean the motorcycle driver watching. And, uh, but this is someone who, he doesn't have an interest in plants particularly, but we've talked to him about the project. He's waiting to take us back out, so he's got nothing else to do. So he is now listening to his own elders talking about plants. And so we had a lot of curiosity. There was a lot of watching us, seeing what we were doing. And we wanted to actively engage uh, people more, and especially the kids. We wanted them to get this information about their elders and the value of that, since their elders are going to pass away. So we went to the school to try and generate some interest, and, and clearly there was a lot of interest, and what they're all raising their hand about is we just started off with, you know, who used plants today? And wha you know, they can't wait. They've all used plants today. I mean, we've all used plants today at some, some level. Um, so we also wanted to tap into what were they doing that's already fun for them, and, and drawing. Kids, little kids like to draw. So we're going to have them draw plants and to put those in the book. Now, I thought kids like to draw. They're all going to want to draw. And, and Grace, who was from there, said, well, if we make it a contest and they can win something, then they're really going to want to draw. <laughs> OK. So we were setting up a contest, and we're buying school supplies as prizes. And, uh, this guy who's selling us the school supplies, he's asking, well, what are you doing? Why do you want these? So we explain to him the project. And so we're talking about the drawing portion of the, of the project. And what's particularly important is this man, because who we're talking to is the head of village education. And now he's sitting there with the plan. He's looking at it, and he's in a room full of healers and so now he's becoming interested in this knowledge of the elders and this understanding of the ecosystem. And the kids, it gets them involved at a whole new level. When you're looking at a plant and you're, you're assessing what is its angle and how would I draw it, and you're connecting with it in a different way than if you were just taking notes on it, but really trying to capture it. Um, so connecting them to the plant and also to language. This down here is in Kiha. So Kiswahili is the language that people throughout Tanzania speak, and Kiha is this tribe's language. So also trying to keep that language alive and useful. And then we have the teachers. We're asking them if they can judge the pictures. So now teachers are getting involved in learning about ethnobotany. This was Adam. He was working with us on the project, and he was talking with these women, and they were kind of asking him, what were we doing? And I, I didn't understand Kiswahili very well, but he kept saying, blah, 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 kiha, blah, 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 kiha, which is the, the language. And I began to get that the fact that something was going to be written in their language, that was huge. And that was a big focus that a lot of them had on this. So in terms of language, this is Rashidi. We brought him to the town of Kigoma. And we're working with translating it from Kiswahili, Kiha, and English. So Grace is working with the Kiswahili. I'm working with the English. And he's working with the Kiha. And we're trying to get the information in all three languages. So this is what the booklet ended up looking like. Um, and so you'd have the plant, the information. And really, this was the big part. This was the Kiha. And we made a big point to have the Kiha came first. This was the language most important. Then Swahili, and then lastly, English. So uh, the list of the plants with the scientific names. Um, and then there were a lot, many more plants that they wanted to include. They were all trying to vote on it. We were trying to limit it. And so a lot of these are actually still being identified um, at the herbarium in Tanzania. 
And for future analysis, we've got the habit, meaning how, what is it a plant, is it a tree, is it a shrub, what part of the plant do they use, how do they collect it, what's their preparation, and how accessible is it, is it in danger, where is it located. So there's all this kind of information with which we can do a more quantitative analysis. But for now, it's about saving their language, I mean, working with the language and this plant information. So in order to give this project more credibility, more importance, we had a big ceremony. Because in this particular community, having a big ceremony is going to make whatever you're doing that much more impactful for, for everyone. So we've got villagers have come, the people who are involved have come, and we have dancers. And what they're wearing are the, that plant we saw in the beginning. They've got a plant, and they've got another seed they stick inside, and they put it on their ankles, and there's a whole ta-ta-ta-ta-ta, which doesn't look anything like that, but they do it, and it's got all this fabulous rhythm, and that's the musical instrument. So they're, they're part of this ceremony. And the point is, we want it to be loud and noisy. We want people to come in. We want people to say, oh, what's happening, and then see it and go, oh, wow, medicinal plants. That's so important, useful plants. Now, I can't pretend that all of these people who are actually there for this, because this group, we had a bit of a captive audience. Um, the chief of the village had been working with land titles of a whole group of people, and he had also agreed that day that we would come and do the ceremony. So we showed up, he's in the middle of doing the land titles, and he said, oh, he's like, okay, you guys wait here, we're gonna have a ceremony. So these people really didn't mean to come, but, but we've got them. And really, whatever brought each person to this event, they're all paying attention. Um, they're absorbed. And here are the ethnobotanical specialists, some of the people that we interviewed. And they've all got their books for the first time. Um, and they're, they're talking about it. They're still discussing the plants, who thinks what. So it's keeping this information in many ways alive and really relevant. And then you just see you know, the quiet response. This is the first time this man has seen his own words in print in Kiha. And you just watch as he opens the book, the smile on his face. And then it was great. Hey, you've got other guys. We don't have any idea who this guy is. <laughs> he got a book, and um, it's now giving him status. He's, he's holding court. He's telling, yeah, medicinal plants this, useful plants that, and suddenly being knowledgeable about these kinds of uses of the environment, that gives you a level of importance. And the school children, the ones who were helping us draw, we're giving them books. And, um, and they're super interested. You know, they're, whoa, you know, what is in, what is in this book? And it went beyond Bubongo, beyond the village, which is what we had intended it to be for them. Um, this is a Western doctor, Western trained doctor, and he had heard that we were making this book, and he, he wanted a copy to see what the information was that the people in Bubongo were, were knowing. This is at the Jane Goodall Institute. Uh, no matter how I now feel about chimpanzees, when you work in that region, it's good to be connected to the Jane Goodall Institute. And they were very helpful with us. And now he's getting a book, and this is kind of odd, because he's the processed food guy. <laughs> huh? The doctor at the Jane Goodall Institute. OK, the dude who sells canned goods. But out there, that's a power position. You don't have processed things. You don't have things in cans or packages. So the guy who does bring that in, he's, the, he's kind of the head honcho of the village in many ways. And then also priests, also influential people in the village. And then the guy at the stationery store. He's like, hey, you know, I heard that book you were talking about was in Kiha. And so he's basically saying, and I would like a book. So we're giving him a book. And then from the back of the store, we heard, I want a book in Kiha. <laughs> so we gave that guy a book. <laughs> um, 
And then other villages came to us, and they were asking that we make a book of their plants and their language. And then it began to expand out in totally unexpected ways. This is the lodger I was, was working, Cosmos. He said, I would like a notebook and a pencil. I said, OK, how come? He said, because I'm going to make a book too, like your book. I said, oh, great, OK. So he was collecting plants, and he was writing the uses. And um, his uses, though, as we were working on it, he explained that he wanted to write about how the animals use the plants, and that, that that was the connection that he was interested in documenting from his knowledge. And so the idea is, with all of this, is if people are valuing the plants, if they know how to use them, then the idea is you'll value the forest in which those plants grow. And just as we're looking at deforestation, which is somewhat disheartening, um, we look here, this has had 10 years regrowth. 10 years is not very much time. This is the exact same landscape, but that has been protected. So you can see that it doesn't take very much in order for something to, to grow back. And you get your Miumba woodland the way it can be and the way the chimps are the happiest. So looking at the conclusion, what, starting with the second question, we'll get to the first question last. What role does language play? What, what, what did this have to do with anything? Oh my gosh, this had a huge amount to do with it. We thought it was, you know, it's the plants and it's the knowledge and that's so exciting. And that was for some, but the fact that it was in Kiha, that's what drew many of them in. Then the fact that it was about plants kind of gained some momentum. What's a good way to include people? Well, definitely the group meetings, bringing them in on every stage of the way, uh, doing the interviews, doing the collecting, and this is really, I would say, what was key was the public aspect of it. Because this is where you had the other people watching and becoming curious and helping this expand out. And then certainly for the kids, also the drawing. The ceremony and presentation, this was big. This, this brought them, and even the captive people, other people came of their own volition. And this became a big oomph. And wow, this must be really important. OK, but then there's the big question. Does this help anything? So we made a booklet. One, they now have a record. We talk about a library is lost. There is now a written record of this information when that person passes away. These people can choose to use that information or not, but they have it. We also wanted to make it really aesthetically pleasing, photos and colors, um, because not everybody is literate. So even if it's in your language, if you can't read, we wanted people to be able to connect with this book. The spatial dimensions. This was, this was not part of our goals at all. It was just we were doing it for Bubongo, for this community. And then when we had other villages saying, please, please come to us, and we actually have a grant in now to go back this summer to work with one of these other villages. The people in town, the Western doctor, the stationery store guy, they're now thinking about these plants. The motorcycle drivers, who knew? The guy making the animal plant book, he was inspired by this to do his own thing. So uh, part of all of this is that we began to see the process itself, having it be public, was really almost as important as the product. That having all these people be involved in what was happening and hearing about it and seeing it, that, that drew a lot of people in. So an answer to this in the present, yes. Um, and the idea is, and what we've yet to see is, it's, it's for the future generations. It's for the next group, for when people pass away. And, and the idea for all of this is that people themselves have access to their own information. This is their information, and they should have it. This is just some acknowledgments for what this picture is. So we've done the ceremony, we've done the dancing, and it rained, and that ended things just a little bit early. And the dancers were not done. <laughs> we're going to come out, so they're stomping and chomping in the, in the mud. And just people were thanking, particularly the village, and then National Geographic um, funded this, this project. So, so that's one example of kind of people, plants, ethnobotany, a booklet in, in Africa. Now we are going to shroop go way somewhere else uh, to the Tibetan Plateau. 
turning your pages to take a fresh notes on this. Got a little rustle happening. All right. Tibet. Whew. So with this book, we now we wanted to have more part participation. We had done this, and really people got excited, sort of peripherally. And now we wanted to really have this be these people's book, and again, working with, with kids. So before uh, I went up to the highlands in Tibet, we were in lowland China, um, beautiful. And there were certain things that I found personally amusing. I was like, I kind of think this girl doesn't really know what her shirt says. <laughs> you know, love, that's cool. But, you know, <laughs> burn, sexy, hot, really? <laughs> so, so I thought, so I'm sneaking up behind her and taking a picture. Cool or not cool, she didn't know I took it, so here we go. <laughs> um, but this takes us back to language again. And, and I'm looking at her shirt, and they so I am orating off the top bunk, and I'll talk about <laughs> what I'm doing. But if you notice the shirt I'm wearing, that's a shirt that I bought at Target. I've been using it in the field for years, because it's brown. <laughs> and it looked kind of cool, it had a Chinese character. I thought that was kind of pretty. And then I brought it to China when I was packing all of my stuff, and I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know what this means. <laughs> you know, what if it means I don't know, your boobs are staring at my eyes or something totally awkward like that. And uh, I, I, was, I was glad to see it did not. It actually, it means love, so I was okay. But again, it was before I laughed at some girl for wearing a shirt for words she didn't know. And I've been wearing that for years before that occurred to me. And what I'm doing is, this is a sheet of paper because I have come back later. We're, we're, we're doing some work and I am going to dinner, and usually somebody who spoke Chinese was also going to dinner, but they weren't tonight. So I had to go and order my own noodles. And I wanted to say, you know, fried, not too spicy, not in a soup, without me with vegetables. And I have no Chinese. I can say shishi. <laughs> and so I am practicing, because it's a tonal language, and it's hard, and I really want to get the right noodles. So there's a whole group of them there down below, and I'm on the bed, and I'm practicing ordering noodles. <laughs> The language was an issue. But when you do get the noodles, it's awesome. They stretch them out, they take them over their head, and they boom, 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 and they beat them, and they cut them, and they're really, really delicious. But again, coming back to what, what role was language, you're walking in China, and there was words, and they were written on the, on the sidewalk. And I, wow, sidewalk art. How, how beautiful is this? And then we, we saw the guy painting, and um, He's painting them in water. I was like, ooh, it's like effervescent art. You paint it, and then it whew, goes away. And I was with somebody who spoke Chinese, and I said, ask him about the art. And, and she did, and she said, he said he's practicing. I was like, why do you have to practice? Aren't you Chinese? I said, yeah, Chinese is hard. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So the rule that the language Language plays in all kinds of realms. So going up to Tibet, we were in uh, the Kham region. And uh, getting the, the human-plant connect in Tibet, they're already very connected to the natural world in so many ways. These are prayer flags. And they write the prayers on the flags. And then they fly, and the prayers go off off into the wind. And when you are, you see these everywhere. They're on the hills, they're on the bridges, and they're stacked up, and they're draped on houses, and it's just, you've got all these words fluttering to the winds. And then also, there's a, uh, a prayer carver. And that's kind of cool, and he's carving them into stones. And there's hundreds of them. All of these stones have prayers written on them. So there's this, this connection with the natural world. So specifically what our project was, is working with international high school students, uh, Tibetan, Chinese, North American, and then he is Chinese American, just to mix it all up, <laughs> confuse all of us. And the idea is we want to connect the Chinese and the Americans to, to the Tibetan landscape. And in so doing, 
also empowering uh, the Tibetan students themselves. So I was working with a rural school in Tibet uh, with Machik and one of their focus is connecting. They really want these kids to be proud of where they are from and get this connection to place. So working with this connection with place um, and, and doing it, in this case, through, through the wild plants, um, in order for me to also help them understand really the people in the land, this was a new area for me. I did a lot of work in Latin America, Africa, and going up here. So really, to get up to the upper plateau gives you a different sense of what's happening. So the most common way to get up to the plateau is on a motorcycle. Now, who here rides a motorcycle? Yeah, OK. So people do. And I grew up in Northern California, where I could pretty much do anything except ride a motorcycle. It was riding a motorcycle is dangerous. Don't do it. If you ever do do it, which you shouldn't do, always wear a helmet. So I'm on a motorcycle with no helmet. And initially, I had sat really far back from him, because it's a different culture. He's male. I'm female. I'm trying to do the right thing. And the villagers are all standing there like, no, 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 get closer. Get, get, get closer. So I get a little closer. I'm like, no, 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 put your arms around him. So I put my arms around him. And they're like, yay, woohoo, And I'm thinking, oh, oh, what's happening? <laughs> and they said, you're on the, on the hills. You want to make sure you want to make your weight his weight. So when he moves, you guys move together. And I was like, oh, OK. And, and I got how important that was when um, that was the road we were on. <laughs> I was like, oh. It's like, I can never tell my parents this. <laughs> and we're doing this, and it's going pretty well. And I'm just thinking, please, 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 don't let us fall off the road. Please, 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 please. And I'm gripping onto him, which is fine, kind of going uphill. But when we go downhill, I start to feel him nudging me back. And I'm like, and I realize I'm squashing him. <laughs> oh. So I go back. I'm hanging on here. I hang on to the back, and I'm squeezing with my thighs. And I'm like, oh, OK. And then he starts to talk to me. And he says, gobbledy gobbledygook, which of course is not what he said, but whatever in Tibetan it was. And I speak no Tibetan. And I think, I don't want him to wonder why I'm not answering. I don't want him to look back and see what's happening. I was like, just Maria, say, say something. So he said, gobbledygoo. And I just said, gobbledygoo. And that worked. Then he said, gobbledygaga. And I went, gobbledygaga. And we did that the whole way up. <laughs> And then I got off the motorcycle, and he was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, we, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> that worked. And when you get up there, I mean, it is you know, just top of the world, but you just, you know, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but you got to be careful. <laughs> you don't want to get run over by a you know, roaming yak, trample you. Um, so they've got the yaks up there. And really, the people who are up there live as nomads. So they move around with the seasons. And yaks are their main livelihood, mostly the milk. And, and butter is a big thing. But you can see, they really they, you know, they give homage to the, to the yak. <laughs> so I'm up there, and they, they serve me some yak milk. And then I get some yak yogurt. And then there's some tea, and I'm very excited. It's got no yak product in it, but then they mix in yak butter. I was like, oh, you know, culturally polite. Like, cool, yeah, yak everything. <laughs> it's better than I thought it would be. Um, so while I'm up there, one of the things we're doing is helping them uh, with, learn some, some English. And, and as they're making the letters, they, they don't know from which direction the A starts. And I realize I don't know which direction the A starts from either. And I'm, and I'm trying to be patient. And um, it's frustrating, because I feel like, how could this be so basic and so hard? And I can't even remember something so, so simple. But then I get some perspective. That's my notebook. And they're trying to teach me Tibetan. And I don't have any idea from which direction a letter starts. Um, but then, that is my notebook. And that is beautiful. And that is not my writing. <laughs> we were teaching a little group of girls, working with them with English. <clears throat> and then they saw my notebook. And they, at first, they were puzzled. How, how could my Tibetan be so 
uh, so bad. <laughs> and, and, then, and then it was kind of disgusted, like, how, you know, this is horrible. And they looked at me, I was you know, the teacher. And then, and then they felt sorry for me. You know, it was, wow, how, how could you be so pitiful? You can't even write Tibetan. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> and then one of the little girls, she just took my notebook, and they had their own work, and she took her, it's, it's a sliced off chopstick, and she dipped it in the ink, and she wrote this beautiful alphabet. And then she just handed the book back to me, and went back to her own work. And I was like, okay. So, so ethnobotany, geography, well, where do these come together and what, what is this project? So in this case, it's the Tibetan youth who are our teachers. We were really conscientious. We want these are the people whose knowledge we want and we want them to be buoyed up and them to connect to their own knowledge. So they're teaching us. And, and when you work with useful plants and you're working with a certain age group, you end up with a lot of edible plants. <laughs> things that you could eat, things you could nibble, things you could suck. It was pretty much, you know, what could you put in your mouth and get something out of it? And, um, and you know, again, but there's another plant there. Hmm. And there were these, these uh, kind of sticky plants, and then they, they found them, and the Tibetans were saying, hey, look what we do. And they threw them at each other, and they stuck in the hair, and they threw them at me. And I'm like, ha, oh, you know, this is fun. OK, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Let's go back to doing the project. And they looked at me, and they said, this is the project. This is, um, these are throwing plants. And what they do is they stick. And I was like, oh, OK. And I'm like, ah, let's empower you guys, but do the plants I want. I was like, oh, right. OK, so those got included in the book. You know, it has hair decorations. <laughs> Um, and then there were plants I was a little more, a little more familiar with these uses. This was um, basketry plants. And, and as we're looking at these, and one of the guys is picking grass, and he's showing this is how you prepare it with your teeth. You run it through your teeth. And, um, and then he's like, now you have your curled grass. And I said, what do you do with curled grass? He looked at me, and he said, you curl it. <laughs> I was like, oh, that went in the book. <laughs> Um, and you know, working with teenagers, it was great. You'd be turn, you'd just turn around and Pah! I was like, hey, I'm like, just taking a rest. <laughs> and you turn around, whoa. Um, and there's not a lot of oxygen up there, so might have something to do with it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of grass clomping. So, but they were also really working hard and um, were collecting plants, and it's kind of hard to see what this is. It's a plant that, that we have, when you take it, you whew. So we had a dandelion. And we asked, what do you do with it? And it said, we make a wish, and we blow. Um, and the Americans love that. <laughs> and the Chinese love that. So they were all whew, together. And it was that they were connecting to each other. And they were doing that through, um, through the natural world. And um, I, I love this. You know, she's pretty good at it. He's great at it. And he's going, I, I didn't grow up with this. <laughs> well, we're emphasizing that they are experts in their own environment. And, um, and, and to give, it increased meaning. When, when you're collecting and you're documenting, this connects them, again, in, in a different way. And we're doing plant identifications. Um, I can see, so we're, we're looking at the scientific names, and we're teaching them how to do some of the scientific parts of it. But if you'll notice, they're doing this, and then there's a little Mickey Mouse hat creeping in. And that's a little kid. And part of the idea of this is to have it be intergenerational. So you have teenagers that we're working with. But then you've got younger children again. It's this watching. They think whatever the older kids do is the coolest. And it's also fascinating. They have people from other parts of China, which is a pretty big deal in Tibet. And they have Americans. And what are they doing? Oh, they're interested in plants and our plants. So we also were interviewing elders, because they're really the ones with the, with the knowledge. And the idea was to have the students interview their own elders, so they don't need me. 
to have them do it themselves. So we're working on, on some techniques, how you analyze. And again, the idea is so that when these people pass away, that knowledge does not die with them. And things started to change. After we'd been interviewing, um, the elders were talking about incense. And we were going home. And one of the kids was like, hey, hey, that's an incense tree. Now, before when we were doing the plants, if he couldn't eat it or, or throw it at somebody, it wasn't included. Now their plant world was expanding, shifting. And the idea is then to bring that out to larger ideas, ecosystem sustainability. Where can we go with this? And it was teaching each other. So again, we've got, we made a, a booklet, Chinese and Tibetan and English. They're drawing the plants, connecting with the specimens. They then gave presentations, and it was always the Tibetan person in the group who gave the presentation that the whole group helped them work on it, but they were the ones speaking out. And all the nationalities working together to, to translate, to make the lights work. You know, and it was frustrating sometimes. It wasn't all hoo-hoo. But the idea is really connecting them to the place, their place, and doing it through this in-depth interaction with the environment and with cultural knowledge. Now, with knowledge, and they're very traditional. You look, and she's got her rosy cheeks, and she's talking to us about her plants, and then we heard this ting, 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 wah, bing. It's like, what? Ting, 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 wah, bing. And she pulls a phone out of her dress and goes and answers it. <laughs> and I realized, you know, that surprised me. That wasn't my image of them, but that's what's real. And this was really brought to light when there was a, a man at the monastery. I went to the monastery where all those stones are, and you circle, and you get kind of good juju when you circle. And, um, and then it started to rain, and I thought maybe you get extra credit, like good Yeda Bahuda, when it rains, if you kept walking, which wasn't true at all, because this guy was like, hey. <laughs> You know, yo, foreigner, come in. And I was like, whoa. And he was the caretaker of the monastery. And I went inside, and he gave me this <sighs> ubiquitous glass of yak milk that always appears. And I had to drink it. <laughs> and he had his prayer beads. I mean, this is the caretaker of the monastery. And I'm holding my yak milk, and I'm looking around, and I see that. I was like, what? <laughs> Not only is it a television, it's a flat screen. It's big. And I was like, you, you spend all day walking in circles and, and, and praying. I was like, yeah, and then I guess he comes home and watches a movie. <laughs> and I had to put this together in my mind. But this was just his reality. So, so again, this connection, culture and nature, it doesn't always look how, how you think it will. And um, again, the idea is to increase empowerment through people's controlling their own knowledge that I don't I don't need to go and do that. And again, so the kids, the kids get it. So also, so they are not victims. Um, but they are empowered through their own work and really reconnecting with the land and the culture and the plants. And through doing that, really reconnecting with themselves and doing this through, through geography. Thank you. Maria, thank you so very, very much. Um, we have time for a few questions. I have a question first, though, if you don't mind, and, and that is this. You, you talk about going to these very isolated places at the far ends of the earth. Um, you reflected on, really, a couple of the challenges that you face, being hit in the head with a rock by a champ, <laughs> OK? And, uh, trying to conquer some Tibetan writing, which our Western minds, I guess, are just not able to decipher. Would you care to share, perhaps in a general sense, what your greatest challenge might have been in these environments? The greatest challenge. I would, did I just turn it up? I would say one of the greatest challenges is 
finding a place really within the communities. There are a lot of physical challenges where it is you know, hiking up hills and, and there's not a lot of oxygen. And actually there was, we were hiking up to a monastery and I said, my group, we're gonna hike. The rest of them were taking buses. And then the other kids wanted to hike with me and I said, you know, sure, sure. And then another person said, Maria, they won't make it. You can't do that. I was like, okay, just my group. So we start hiking and, um, and I have never hiked where there is very little oxygen. <laughs> So my group is all, and they're all 16 years old. And I'm like, <laughs> and it was so humbling and so embarrassing and so mortifying. And I would just have to sit down because I could not breathe. And my image of myself as being able-bodied and going up and being tough and showing everybody that, I was like, I got to suck it up because <laughs> I can't walk. Um, so there was a humbling, like the physicality of that. And we did make it to the monastery, really, after everybody else was up there. So there's those. but the. The real challenge is, is how, how to have people accept, accept me in the community. H how do I find the balance between learning from them, trying to offer what I have to give, being respectful, understanding boundaries that are new to me, and frankly, also, being out there is so incredible, and you're in another culture, and I just sometimes I can't believe I'm out there. And also, sometimes it drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm tired of watching every move I make. I am tired of trying to be socially correct with everything I do. I'm tired of having somebody follow me every, when I go to bathe, I'm gonna have a little group of kids who are like, oh, you know, what's this look like? <laughs> um, that, gets, that gets hard. And, and not, not the question of challenge, but it's also so incredible when you do start to feel like you're just part of it. When I was up in the tent with the nomads, and I'm so, I've got, oh, I've you know, tried to learn you know, 10 words of, of um, Tibetan, and, I, and I'm trying to say those, and we're, we're working with it, and I'm trying to be respectful, and they're trying to figure me out, and we're, and we're doing this whole thing. And then at some point, it just started to relax. And we were laying down, and they were laughing, and I was laughing, and I thought maybe I understood why. <laughs> Um, but there was a shift, so there's that moment when you, when you do get there, and it is so incredible to really feel like you're, you're a part of it, as much as an outsider ever can be. And, um, and it's hard getting to that point. That takes a lot of energy and a lot of emotional kind of fortitude for me. Well, well, you're revealing much concerning the notion of sense of place, really. And for these people, both in Asia and in Africa, this matter of plants is a connection to their place. And it must be uh, extremely frustrating for the older generations to see their, their children lost to technology in, in many ways. Yeah. Would you care to elaborate on that just for a few moments, maybe? interactions you had with some members of the older generation that yeah. may have commented on those things. It's, it's interesting and it's complicated because also my image was, and they certainly were projecting this in the beginning, that you know, we care about this and they just care about their cell phones. And it was never as simple as just that. We were in one of the meetings with the healers in Africa and uh, people are talking, which plants do we use, and people are really involved. And one of the guys has uh, an iPad and he's trying to figure out how to take pictures. And he just keeps taking pictures of himself. And he's looking at that, and everyone starts looking at that. And it was, that was confusing to me. Because I thought, wait, don't you guys care about the plants and the environment? And it's younger generation that just cares about their phones. And there is some truth to that. And technology is really exciting for all of us. And it's hard for me, because when I want to say, oh, well, technology, you guys shouldn't have that. That disconnects you. I have a cell phone. Does it disconnect me from what's around me? Often, yes. But I'm not in a position to say, you guys can't use what I use. And there is a difference with the generations there and the interest. The older people are connected. They've grown up using those plants. And many of the younger generation haven't. Many of them may have used some, but they also are getting medicines from, from the store, um, which of course is hard when you don't have very much money. So it, it is, there is a divide. And when you watch some of the younger generation get excited about what the older generation knows, it's just a new level of connection, again, to place. 
and place for all of us. If you think if there's a, you know, a, a tree that you grew up with in your yard and that means something to you. If it means something to you, then your yard means something to you and that tree means something to you and where you are means something. And for them to, to be attached to place, because also certainly as television comes in, you see people living really differently in other parts of the world and that looks really appealing. And again, I'm not one to say you can't go live that way. And it complicates where they, where they do live and what, what that interaction is. And again, with the generations, you know, when that woman pulled the cell phone out of her dress, we are up in the middle of the mountains and there's nothing there. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> and then I had to catch myself. I'm like, why are you judging her? And, and so it's having, for me to also have to absorb that this is what people are doing. So also, as some people have said, which I think is a good suggestion, is with the booklets and things, how about putting them on the web? There's a little bit of complication between you have to get the rights and those people have to want that. Um, but then also, they actually don't have Wi-Fi often, many of them, but if they could get somehow this on their phones at all, that might excite them about that information in a different way. So it's also looking at maybe incorporating that. Yeah. That's a good question. Can you so repeat being a that? Female, Can pardon? you repeat the question? Ah, just asking, did I ever feel discredited being a female in many of these male-dominated cultures? Which is really a good question, because that, um, that comes up. And you know, it's interesting, because my experience, for the most part, has been that often as a female, it's almost easier for me to get in, because I'm not threatening to them that it is considered, you know, I'm just a chick, what could I do? <laughs> and so often, I'm invited in more easily sometimes than, than a man would be. I'm certainly then more privy to what women would talk about. They're much more open with me. And in many ways, I get to straddle the worlds because also I can go out into the forest with the men. They will take me out there, where sometimes they wouldn't take the women. Because I'm a little bit neither here nor there. There was actually one point I was um, well, I was, I was wearing pants, uh, field pants out there, and, and the women all, all wear skirts. And uh, one of the kids came up and asked one of the people with, he's like, is that a man? And you know, I'm like, wow, I've never had that mistake happen. <laughs> and so there was also, I think, a little confusion about exactly what I am. And actually, another time I was, it was in Africa, and I was walking, I was doing some work down the road with people, and I bumped into some other people, and they were all cutting up elephant meat. Actually, the whole thing is very exotic to me. And they were like, oh, come over, come over. I was like, oh, OK. And they invited me into the hut. I'm like, oh, this is so exciting. And they pointed for me to sit down. And there were these little tiny stools that the, they were sitting on. So I sat on a little stool. And um, I'm like, oh, I'm in Africa. I'm in a hut. Woohoo! And then I looked, and I heard, and all the women were on the other side of the hut. And I was like, Oh, and they were going, ah, ah, ah. I was like, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and so I went over to the woman's side, and they were all sitting on mats on the ground. So they were lower, that much lower, but lower. And, and then everybody settled down when I sat. But you know, the men had invited me there. So it's sometimes I'm a little neither here nor there. So actually, for me, I have found that I do have access to people. now. Do I have to look out for my personal safety? Yes, and I think in a different way. Um, I had my little bike, and I was very excited after all, because I'm, you know, how body, how body to everybody who saw me, and, um, but not after dark. You know, not, not that I would necessarily do that in places in the United States as well, but I would make sure I would bicycle in before dark so I wasn't out as a woman alone after dark. And I, a, a male researcher, that might be different. It might not. Um, so. In my personal experience, I, I've been really treated with respect, although many of these societies, in certain ways, there is a level of sexism that, um, that is different than, than to what I'm used to. Hi, hi there. Hey. Two questions. Yeah. Um, the first was, with reference to your scientific um, naming nomenclature, did you ha have 
um, readily accessible keys that were indigenous to that area, or how did you come about actually identifying the plants scientifically? Right, good question. So how do we identify the plants? I've got those fancy scientific names. And, and as I was saying earlier, I've taken my botany classes and learning how to key out plants, and I go to a place I don't know, and there's no chance. <laughs> I'm like, that's right. I'm like, oh, I'm a geographer, not a botanist. You know, I wear that hat. So actually for this, uh, Grace has more botany than I do, but also we took them to the um, university in Dar es Salaam, uh, one of the big cities in Tanzania, where they have an herbarium, and you work with specimens that they have there, and you, you, they have keys, but also you compare specimens to see if they overlap, and they're also botanical experts there. So that is a good question. How do you get that scientific aspect taken care of? And that's really where teamwork and collaborative work comes together. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and then just secondly, is there, is there a message in terms of just the, tr the, the tenets that you're presenting in terms of transferring that to even our own country? And I look back and I think of my grandmother who's 104 and she's got more plant concoctions than I can even care to remember. And just to learn from her, you know, well, you use this for a burn and you use this if you're not, you know, and, and it's like, I wonder if there's a piece of this that we've lost to, or maybe it calls upon us to, I don't need to editorialize, but to maybe be mindful about that to our elders and what they know and maybe what history is still within our, our grasp. And it's a, a wonderful both question and comment. And absolutely, I go work out in the boonies because I'm into that. And I teach ethnobotany at my university and it's always their projects, they, have, they all have to do a project and it all has to be that they have to, it's boots on the ground, so it has to be in Florida. And it has to be either talking to elders or looking at how plants are used in different ways. So absolutely, I, I am a big believer that, because if it's a place that I have chosen, I don't think that has any more importance than any other place. And I think all of the things that are happening out here are happening right here. And absolutely, you know, if any of God, you know, if you, you all have elders and grandparents who do use plants in any way, you know, not to tell you what to do, but I'm gonna tell you what to do. <laughs> Just take a minute, write some of them down so that that doesn't get lost here where it's already so much of it has been lost. But absolutely, and that's a big, and there's lots of people who do ethnobotanical work in the United States. That's also really a big common thing to do. But it is something that we can all do, right? Of course, my grandparents are dead, so I'm off the hook. <laughs> in the beginning of it, you had emphasized um, using their language first. I believe you said it was Kiha. Mm -hmm. um, why was that so important to use theirs first? And you've previously or followed it up with there wasn't much literacy. So he was really proud that it's his words in writing and it acted like he'd never really seen that. How does that play a role in this whole situation? Ah, that's a good question. So, and also, I, I might have misspoke. They're not, there's quite a few of them are literate. But the seeing. Seeing your own language in print, and it's something I had to get used to that because we see English in print all the time. We see it all over the place. And I had to really get into the mindset, if you had, you know, and some of you perhaps English is not your first language. And to have that be validated in terms of print, and it's hard to say why when something is written down it becomes more important. But there's something about that that it just is. So when, when people see their own words written down in something um, sort of official, I mean, uh, the booklet that looks more professional than other things, there is a sense of, wow, my culture, my tribe, is the words and the language we use, which is usually always pushed down. So. It's, you know, English, that, you know, hey, you gotta learn English, you gotta learn English. Oh, Kiswahili, well, that's what everybody's speaking. Well, what about the language of us? Well, the tribe is not so important. And we're saying, yes, it is, and that's why it was so important to have it first. To not have the other languages precede it, but to show that's the place we were putting it. Uh, question of the general nature. Yeah. Do you think it is possible that we kind of register as possible, as uh, accurate, the cultures which are slowly disappearing for our benefits from whatever you had today presented to us, but some other aspects too. Do you think it's possible to do that? I have been in 
Africa where you cannot go with any type of car back uh, in 1982. Cool. The language was Kikongo. Well, except my translator, nobody could understand. I was attending order of a dinner for guests of honor, that was me. No Verizon, just Tam Tam. I was listening to that. It is reality. I didn't see it in Hollywood movie. So question is, can we register that for the benefit of future generations? I think just to make sure so everybody could hear, can we register, make sure I have it right, all the cultures, and then also sharing a little bit about the experience of being way out there a long time earlier before I was out there. It was probably a lot more exotic. Um, I mean, I, I think we have to try. I just think there's so much rich culture. There are a lot of people who are working with just language. So these languages don't die away because, again, the first thing with culture, if your language goes, your culture starts to go. And so I think that what makes this world as interesting and rich and diverse and what we have to learn from each other, I feel like we have to try. Can we? I, I, I can't go that far. I'm just going for the effort we can put into it. How does your work tie in with the pharmaceutical companies and so forth? I mean, you're hearing you talk about these plants and so forth, I think of all the pharmaceutical companies that are doing a lot of this and trying to find drugs and so forth. That's a really good question. So asking about the pharmaceutical companies and, and finding new drugs, the cure for cancer. When I first started doing ethnobotanical work, I was all about medicinal plants. And, and that, to me, I, I'd heard about it, I knew about it. It's very exciting. You go out and it's all green, and those, those leaves actually mean something to someone, and they can cure you. And there was a combination. One is I, I, um, I was actually saying earlier that I was, I was going out with a, a curandero, a healer in, in Ecuador. And we, I used to go out every day, and I'd write down all his plants and take them. And then one day, I had kind of a sore throat. And I was like, hey. I was like, hey. I'm <laughs> And what should I take? And he said, well, why don't you take two aspirin so we can go? <laughs> what? <laughs> so partly, I wanted to work with things I could see and touch and people would make things out of, as opposed to not that they don't use those plants, but I didn't see the actual use as much. And there's the whole concept of intellectual property rights. And that is with the pharmaceutical companies. And I initially, there's a, a company called Shaman Pharmaceuticals. I kept trying to get a job with them. They finally wrote me back after I got into graduate school. And I was like, Bruh. Um, where they're trying to work with the shaman's knowledge as a way to find the alkaloids. I mean, the plant, I mean, the medicines we have now. Aspirin originally comes from the willow tree. I mean, there's so many medicines we use that have originally come from plants. And so sh pharmaceutical companies are saying, well, let's find what that alkaloid is, what is that chemical composition, and then basically we're going to synthesize it. And in so doing, it is very complicated because before you just take the information and leave. Now people are trying to be more conscientious, but do you give that to the healer who told you? But what if all the healers in the region know that information, you just weren't talking with them? So do they all get some of that money? Should the country get the money? Does that go to a corrupt government where those people will then never get the money? If you influx a whole bunch of money to a culture that's not used to working with it, is that a help? Is that a detriment? It's, it's really complicated. And of course, if the cure for cancer is out there, we all want that. So it's sort of a long answer to your question. That's, that's a huge issue that is up there. And frankly, part of my way of handling it is I have backed away literally from, from medicinal plants. So actually, so this book, medicinal plants are part of it. But we also had all those other categories of plants that are important. And as someone is saying, especially with the Africa one, they said the really, really powerful ones, they said they're not telling you those. And I was like, fair enough, because we made it very clear. We only want to know what you want to share with us. So but that's a good question, because it's, it's complicated and Pharmaceutical companies are, are out there, yeah. We're gonna take one more question over here and then um, Dr. Fadiman will answer it and then I will make some closing comments, okay? Um, hi there. Um, hi. First I wanna say thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation that you've uh, done. Oh, and um, 
I was highly intrigued. There's something that normally intrigues me. It normally has to do with something that concerns me or, you know, a thought. And uh, a big thing for me is like technology nowadays in the United States and how it affects our generation uh, opposed to generations where you were, where there was technology and you could see that separation in between when the, the elders who didn't use the technology opposed to the, uh, uh, the kids who were using them. Um, how would you say it would be like different and compare and contrast like to say like if they did have technology there, do you feel like like in the United States, I almost feel like it isn't as important to kids to learn about nature and to learn about because we have it so easily accessible. So like part of it for me is like, I guess the question is, do you feel like uh, as uh, different parts of the uh, world start to learn more and more about technology and things get easier. Do you see, think there would be as much of a care there or do you feel like it would get more leaned upon like it is here nowadays? So just to kind of see if I, so, so there's a use of technology here and there's a bit of a generation gap here and kind of looking at that generation gap there and, and looking a little bit kind of comparing the, the two groups? Well, would you say that, um, like, the, the relying on technology, um, like, what, what would you say, um, I guess I don't really know how to word it, but could you say that uh, the, the relying on technology, would you, like, say to people in the United States that it should be important that you educate yourself you know, like the people that are so highly interested there, would you say that it would be important to take that and grasp that here for kids our age? Okay, so I think if I'm gonna, I'm gonna interpret this the way I, and, I, and you're, see, I'm sure you're saying it clearly, I'm trying to got my older lady brain on. <laughs> That's not technology. Um, sort of some, some of the issues I feel with technology there, would some of those apply here and also having people here be as connected to, to nature here as opposed to there, even though it's a somewhat different situation? He's giving it to me, maybe that's what you meant or not, but I appreciate that. Um, yes. <laughs> I think that being connected to the natural world, this is my opinion, I think it is essential to human beings and to, not to sound cheesy, but to the health of the planet, that we are so separated from that. Um, and that doesn't mean it's lost, though. And I think technology, and again, I'm probably not a great person to ask about technology. I can turn my cell phone on, I can text, and we've just about hit my limit with what I know how to do. So, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, in many ways it adds so much, and we increase our communication in many ways, and of course we limit it and all of that. But also, in terms of, of where technology plays a role in our further separating from nature, and I'd say we're already so separate in many ways, but we also aren't. It's even things like we're in here and we are separated from the ground and we've got something above us and walls, but we've got windows and what we have out there is you're, we're growing grass, which has got its own ecological problems, but, and trees, and there are things that we're naturally connected to that people do bring into their world. So I think tapping into what people already like and, and want, I did a, a project on urban parks in Shanghai. Shanghai, I mean, it is thick with pollution. My friend jumped out and took a picture one day because the sky was blue. And like, it just never happens. You know, it was, well, that is true. And, and I was talking the urban parks there and people flock to the parks. So I think there's something innate in all of us that we are connected to the, to the natural world. And, and we do live in a different world. And I'm not saying we need to go sleep in the dirt. That's, that's not how, how we function. But it is a way of looking at how can we incorporate more? You know, is it talking to our elders about their plant use? Is it looking at the plants in our world and saying, well, how could we connect a little bit more? And with technology, I think different people just feel differently. Some may say use technology to do that. I don't know how they do that, but I'm going to grant them that possibility. <laughs> Mine would be to take a step back for a little while and, and you know, kind of look up instead of down. It's, well, it appears shy. that through these booklets and through the uh, manner in which the booklets are are relating um, this this indigenous plant knowledge to local communities in Africa and Tibet, you have this this project going on as well. There is a sense of empowerment that is developed among those 
that are residing in some of these areas. It's despite globalization with this technology that is, is rampant across the world, it appears that perhaps these, these youths are um, developing a sense of pride as they take ownership in their heritage, perhaps more so than they would have otherwise had they just become deeply immersed in that, I'll say, Western-oriented technology. It's very intriguing. I've not thought about it in that manner before, especially with regard to ethnobotany. That being said, I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Maria for her talk. Please, a round of applause. Geography lives, amen? Yes. All right, go out there and spread the word.